it's a real privilege to be uh, interviewing Governor Pataki. I knew him uh, back when he was practicing the art of government and had the pleasure of reading his book, Beyond the Great Divide. Unfortunately, Alison Pataki uh, is not going to be with us because the electricity in her town uh, has all been knocked out by the storm and she can't get Wi-Fi. So hopefully we'll have another chance to interview her. Uh, but the real regret is that she has written a historical novel, Queen's Fortune, uh, which is absolutely a literary tour de force. It's a wonderfully written book, beautifully written. And it's in the genre of Gore Vidal's uh, Lincoln and Dava Sobel's Galileo's Daughters, Daughter. And uh, it's really an amazing insight into Desiree and Napoleon and Empress Josephine, but through their personal interactions, which are fictional, uh, you view the history, and most of all, you understand the personality that Napoleon expressed during his rule. I strongly recommend uh, Queen's Fortune. I loved reading it. I was totally absorbed. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn to Governor Pataki. He really needs little introduction. Uh, but his book, Beyond the Great Divide, is both a very pessimistic audit of today's uh, political climate, which is in irons, uh, where not anything is really getting done, uh, with, because of the fundamental issues which have divided the, poli the polity. And uh, he will explore with us how issues such as abortion, Me Too, race, uh, Obamacare have different cultural uh, bodies and uh, also uh, different political cultures. So with that, I'll skip over, unfortunately, Allison's interview and turn to the governor. I have coupled a lot of these questions together so the governor uh, can have a free flow in answering sort of a, a section of, of questions, uh, and all of them are related to the book. Governor, let's start with the title of your book, which is Optimistic and Holding Out That There Is a Solution to America's Right-Left Dysfunctional Politics. Abortion, race, environmental protection, climate change, women's rights, immigration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are each ripe and urgently powerful issues which demand political attention and resolution. You state that the battle started with Bush 43 putting race and abortion front and center, followed by Obamacare being rammed through Congress over Republican objections. It seems, however, that this violent yet inanimate, pol inanimate politics started with Lyndon Johnson's Great Society versus Ronald Reagan's get the government off our backs philosophy. Please elaborate on your thesis and how you suggest that we can bridge this philosophical canyon and reestablish pragmatic progressive politics. Well, Ken, thank you. And, and thank you for doing this. And let me start by saying, I bet we both wish we were under a tent in East Hampton having clams and oysters. <laughs> and I would have Alec Baldwin raking me across the coals, but. I guess this is as good as we can do in this new era, but uh, I certainly miss seeing one, everyone out there. And uh, Dennis, thank you for, for doing what you're doing with the library. It's an event that uh, I've never presented there, but my daughter has and my son has, and we've been out there a number of times. It's just a great event. And it's too bad it has to be done virtually this time. Um, Ken, what I tried to do in the book is to be optimistic. And, and I wanted to do two things. I wanted to tell the story of rebuilding Ground Zero, September 11th and the rebuilding of Ground Zero, because I think anyone who looks at it objectively sees that as a success. Uh, and government being able, at a time of crisis, to both function effectively and then after the immediate crisis, 
to rebuild in a way that uh, is not just economically successful, but inspiring for generations who weren't even born on September 11th. So that's a large part of the story. And the second is based on the title, Beyond the Great Divide, because right now we are in the midst, sadly, in my view, of a great divide between the political class in Washington. And I don't think that started back in the era of Lyndon Johnson or Ronald Reagan with their different competing views of society. Because if you remember, Reagan's big economic plan was only able to succeed because he got a very large number of Democrats in the House to vote in favor of his economic plan. And in fact, in a, in a sign of those times, after that happened, Tip O'Neill called him up in a famous phone call said, you're a very effective adversary. Congratulations, you really beat me. Can you imagine today if Congress did something like that uh, on behalf of President Bush or four years ago on behalf of President Obama, either Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer calling up Trump or McConnell calling up Obama saying, congratulations, you're an effective opponent. We've gotten to the point where political differences are no longer acceptable among personal friends. Uh, and we've got to move beyond that. So I try to trace how that happened. Uh, and I probably do my best to tickle off both parties because I start off with one of the few positives that came out of September 11th. And that is that Americans were more united than we've ever been in our lifetime. Uh, and I would walk the streets of New York, I would go to Washington, and we weren't Republicans or Democrats, black or white, south or north, young or old. We were Americans, we've been attacked, and we were gonna stand together and overcome it. And I tell a story about Charlie Rangel, one of the most partisan Democrats I've ever dealt with, who I love. We were good friends, but he was the most partisan guy imaginable, actually thanking uh, President Bush in New York a year after the September 11th attacks. And then you contrast that to today. Uh, and how do we get there? That's half of it. The other half is how do we get beyond it? So I start out by the Iraq war. The Iraq war was what began the divide after September 11th. For years, we had that sense of unity. And then all of a sudden, driven by Dick Cheney, Bush decided to go into Iraq because they had weapons of mass destruction. The country started to divide, but then it got more so, and it turns out there were no weapons of mass destruction. And we started to see policy differences become more fracturing uh, in both a partisan and a personal nature. And then I talk about uh, President Bush's reelection campaign. Both John Kerry and President Bush went to the base. Uh, and I had never seen that before. In 2000, Bush ran as a compassionate conservative, reaching out to minorities and non-traditional Republican voters. In 2004, he ran on social conservative issues, on issues, uh, and I tell the story of Karl Rove actually telling me how uh, there were 8 million evangelicals who didn't vote in 2000 and they wanted to give them a reason to come out in 2004. So it was a very partisan campaign. And on the one hand, it was successful, he won. On the other hand, how can you govern when you govern by fractioning the country? And his second term did not have the successes that it should have. And then I trace that through Obama and then, of course, the beginning of the, the Trump era. Uh, and it's just tragic to me how we have gone from being the most uni united of, of, in my lifetime after September 11th to the most divided in my lifetime right there. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the. Uh the notion of 9-11, which is so prominently uh, portrayed in your book. And I remember your terrific role during those days. Uh, you emphasize in the book that engendering hope and public confidence during and after a catastrophe such as 9-11. But your excellent leadership in the aftermath of 9-11 never falsely misled the public about the magnitude and the challenge ahead nor did you ever deny your responsibility as governor to use public power to remedy the distress. Indeed, you formed the Downtown Development Corporation to carry that out against much contention. And you, you had direct involvement 
in building the World Trade Center, even selecting the architect uh, over other points of view. You put forward the idea of a modern transportation hub being built, which cost the Port Authority, I was a commissioner, uh, $4 billion extra, but it's certainly an important addition uh, to downtown New York. And you personally got involved in getting Amex to stay, American Express Corporation to stay. Uh, and even more importantly, got Goldman Sachs to commit to building a new headquarters right opposite the World Trade Center. So rather than denying responsibility, you gripped it while engendering hope. How do you regard President Trump denying the president's responsibility to orchestrate a national response to COVID-19, in fact saying it was a hoax or that it would disappear or master an individual option, open up early or the scientists or alarmists are wrong? Is this inspiring hope or a historical dereliction of duty? You said that the best way for an incumbent to run for office is to govern. Do you think that Trump is following your advice? You know, I think he thinks that he's following my advice, but I, <laughs> but I, would, but I would disagree with that because I think on the COVID-19 issue, you know, there just hasn't been a national vision as to what the country should be doing. Um, as you said on September 11th, you know, I grabbed responsibility. We had a very public process, but at the end, I knew I was the one who either was going to get things done or not get things done. And you can always hide in the background or blame somebody else for failure, but that's not why you run for office. You run for office to try to achieve success. And I think with Lower Manhattan, we've been able to do that. Uh, in this case, you know, yes, the governors have to take the lead. Uh, the 50 states, the, the one size fit all, fits all doesn't work. Even in the New York state, you know, I'm up in the Adirondacks now. There hasn't been a case in this whole county or the surrounding counties in over 10 days while down on, in Queens and in Long Island, there's still a lot of issues, uh, but there has to be national guidance. There has to be a leader who says science, you know, even as science is evolving and no one is a hundred percent certain as to what the right treatment or the right protocols are. Dr. Fauci was saying, don't wear a mask. It doesn't help. Uh, back in March, you need to publicly go out there and say to the best of our knowledge, this is what we believe are the best things that should be done. This is what should be done proactively to prevent it. This is what we should be doing uh, in the best treatment protocol. And obviously decisions have to be made locally, but we haven't had that strong national vision as to what should, we should be doing. In fact, Vice President Pence, with his 20 days or 25 days to flatten the curve, actually did make a serious effort at doing that and we did flatten the curve, but sadly, it's just one of many instances where the political leadership in Washington at all levels, in my mind, has, has failed us. And one of the things that, one of the kernels of optimism in this book, even in the midst of the great divide, is I don't think the American people are as divided as the political leadership thinks they are or as the media makes them out to be. I think of almost all the major issues facing us today, the American people could be behind a consensus. It may be center right, it might be center left. In some cases, it may be very liberal. In some cases, it could be very conservative, but the American people are not idiots. And they understand intuitively what they think is right for the country. It's the ideologues in Washington and both parties who want to polarize for their own political benefit and who can't see the common ground we need to achieve. And that's some of those issues are things that I talk about where there are, I believe, solutions that we never see coming out of either, either party in Washington. That's a perfect segue to the next question. You speak of both parties being captives of their extremists in the book. Uh, how does that square with the Democrats overwhelmingly selecting Joe Biden, a quintessential centrist nominee with five decades in the political establishment? and a mainstream democratic policy agenda to be the presidential nominee. Uh, just look at the primaries in the last few weeks. I mean, you had uh, longtime members of the House, liberal Democrats, people like Elliot Engel, lose 
the democratic socialists, self-proclaimed socialists who want to overturn the, the current structure. Uh, and that's not uh, an isolated incident. It's, it's, it's one that has happened all across the country. Just on Tuesday, two days ago, a long-term liberal was defeated by an activist leftist in Missouri outside of uh, in the area around St. Louis. And uh, Biden, I think, is an aberration. I think it was the entire party structure saying the alternative are either Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, both of whom will lose. And there was such a overwhelming desire, and there still is, to defeat Donald Trump that they put aside everything to try to get the best person who they thought had the best chance to beat Trump. And it wasn't Elizabeth Warren. It wasn't Bernie Sanders. So this was a massive effort to try to head off the left and the Democratic Party, where all the energy is now, and, and where all the energy will be next year, I fear, um, by putting uh, Biden out as the nominee. Thank you. On page 175 of your book, you state that you cannot deny Republican economic policy, tax reform, and regulatory policy have been a great success. How do you can do you ignore one of your own greatest government achievements, namely three uh, terms of balanced budgets in no place like New York? And- uh, Surpluses, surpluses. <laughs> surplus, exactly. When the tax cuts were premised on a multi-year trillion dollar deficit each year. Uh, and in, it was aimed toward the 1%, where 84% of all the benefits went to the top 1%. It did not create any new investment by the corporations because they already had so much cash and they used it to buy back stock. So how can you say that in this type of situation, the new tax policy of the Republicans was successful? And second of all, you speak of deregulation being a success. The way I read it, most of the deregulation occurred in relation to environmental regulations and public safety and health regulations. How do we see this as a success when we have every scientist in the world, including Trump's own administration scientists, saying that climate change is an existential crisis and it's around the corner, whether it's 20 years or 50 years, how does deregulating the environment when the automobile companies say, no, no, we'll go with the new pollution standards in California, and the president of the United States says, absolutely not. We won't have you do that. So let me understand the, what was behind your declaration. Let me try. Ken, Ken, I love you, but your politics are clearly coming through loudly and very clearly. In and, that and intentionally. Uh, and intentionally. The way the way that I got New York going again was exactly through tax cuts and regulatory reform. We passed the most massive tax cut program in New York State ever because the way you balance federal budgets is not by raising taxes on an ever shrinking pie. It's by growing the pie enormously and making people pay their fair share of those taxes. And when you look at where we stood when the COVID-19 crisis hit, we had the lowest unemployment for African Americans, for women, and for minorities in the history of the country. We had the strongest economy in the history of the country. We had the longest economic expansion in the history of the country. Economic inequality was declining because the largest wage increases were going to the lowest level workers because the labor market being tight, you had to pay more for those people that you needed to do the less uh, technically required uh, positions in, in business. So the economy, one of the reasons we haven't completely cratered, even with this global and national shutdown, is because our economy was doing so well at the time because of the tax reform, because of the relief, and because of the regulatory relief. Now, I'm not going to sit here and defend everything President Trump does. Uh, I consider myself, and I consider the environment, I consider myself to be someone who cares enormously about the environment. It's one of my priorities as governor. And it should be one of every one of us, uh, our priorities as we look to the future, because whether it's whether you're in government or whether you're just talking about your family or your community, the goal should be to make things better after you have passed your time here. 
Uh, and one of the most important ways to do that is in the environment. So I'm not going to stand here and support President uh, Trump's environmental policy because I don't. But things like the tax reform, we had a corporate tax rate that was totally non-competitive. And companies like uh, uh, Google and Facebook and, and others had trillions, I think the number was about $4 trillion in earnings that they made from overseas sales that they kept overseas and didn't bring back because um, uh, the corporate tax structure was so non-competitive here. I also think Trump is right about China, putting in place tariffs on Chinese products, putting in place a, uh, the effort at a new trade agreement, because there's no question that we were uh, hollowing out America's industrial base and our blue collar job base because China was completely unfairly competing and stealing billions, hundreds of billions in, in our intellectual properties. So that all changed for the positive under Trump. I think the environmental things went too far, and I think that is a change for the negative. Uh, but I do think that when you look at those economic policies, apart from President Trump, see, and that, can, that to me is the biggest issue. Trump is such an overarching personality, and people so dislike the man that it's impossible to acknowledge that he ever did anything good. And I understand the emotion. But what I try to do when I look at things is look at the rationality. And you don't have to like the man to say that some of these policies work because they did. Thank you. Uh, in the book, you make a significant point of the Ferguson demonstrations slash riots and the fact that the police officer was not indicted after two prosecutors individually investigated the incident. But you did not mention that the Justice Department found that there was systematic racism in how Ferguson Police Department administered law enforcement. Which brings us to George Floyd. Does this event differ from Ferguson? And what changes must be made to remedy systematic racism in policing? 26 million people across the nation demonstrated after having watched Floyd's death on television with limited looting and property damage. Do you agree with President Trump's description of widespread rioting led by domestic terrorists and its introduction of federal policing in Portland? Um, first of all, uh, <laughs> Ken, I'm amazed at your questions. That you'd think I was running for office and you're trying to take my head off there. Of course, not at all. No, George, that's not George, the case. Ferguson and George Floyd are completely different incidents. Floyd, the George Floyd case is a case of murder by a police officer. He has been charged with that, and in my view, appropriately so. And certainly the protests and the outrage arising from that are justified, and I share every bit that, of that outrage. Uh, and certainly I think uh, we need to take a systemic look at not just policing, certainly policing in this country, but also at the entire relationship between African Americans and the, the white society. And I think it's important to look at that. But the point that I was trying to make in the book, going back to Ferguson, is that I think President Obama was a tremendous disappointment. I didn't vote for him, but when he won in 2008, I was actually very optimistic because of his speech where he said, we're not red state Americans or blue state Americans, we're purple state Americans, we're all in this together. He was a historic candidate, an African American, and I thought that would be an enormous positive for this country because the greatest single um, divide in our history and in our country has been race. And I thought he had the ability to rise above it and inspire people to put aside our, the racist part of our history and put aside discrimination today and bring us together. And he didn't do that. And he didn't do that. And I think the biggest example was Ferguson, where if you remember, um, uh, Attorney General Holder actually went to, the, to Michael Brown's funeral, who had been holding up a store, assaulting someone, and who Obama's Justice Department found almost a year later, uh, had been trying to wrestle the police officers and run away from them, reaching into the car. This is Obama's Justice Department finding. And, and this is after six months of hands up, don't shoot. They also found that that never happened, that the person who said that was lying because numerous other witnesses said that never happened. And that became 
a huge division along racial lines during the presidency of Barack Obama. And I think he, instead of bringing us together racially, as I had great hopes that he would, I think that and other incidents brought us apart. But that doesn't mean you, could, you know, keep trying. I still think when you look to the future of this country, the most important issue is for us to be able to be united going forward and understand, given uh, so much of the racist history of this country, that we have an obligation to do work overtime and double our efforts to bring us together in every way, including racially. Uh, so I don't in any way uh, disagree with the protests. Uh, that happened. I think it's appropriate. It's an expression of outrage that is completely understandable and justified. But on the other hand, I do believe that you have had radicals looking to take advantage of this, Antifa and others, some simply to loot. Uh, and that's not a legitimate protest. That's a violent crime. I think it's going to hurt New York City's future when people have these images of out-of-control out of mobs looting stores along Fifth Avenue. Uh, I think that is something that you can't justify and you can't look the other way. And then when you have these assaults in the federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon, uh, should the federal government has just, just stood aside and said, okay, take over a federal courthouse, trash it and burn it to the ground, we'll look the other way because the local officials aren't doing anything. I think the federal government has an obligation to defend its property like a federal courthouse. And that is what they did. They have now reached, I understand, an agreement with the state of Oregon and the federal officials so that uh, the federal presence will be even less than it is today. But I don't think the federal government should stand aside. I don't think the local government should stand aside. I think uh, Seattle made a mistake when they ordered the police out of the Capitol Hill uh, occupied uh, precinct, the CHOP, uh, and there were a couple of murders. There was, uh, there was violence and looting there before they finally said this was a mistake and went back in. Uh, I don't think you can give in to criminals. Uh, protesters, uh, demonstrators, they're not criminals. But people who would uh, um, assault federal officials, burn a federal building, uh, engage in horribly lawful activity, they have to be stopped. And unless you have that attitude, we're going to see crime, as we have seen in New York City over the course of the last three or four months, skyrocket. And the idea that you're going to send a message, we're going to be racially better off because New York City takes a billion dollars out of the New York City Police Department. In my mind, is nonsense. That's just going to hurt uh, the future of the city because one of the key things that was necessary to bring New York back when I took office, we were the most dangerous state in America. People forget that. You know, everybody thinks, oh, New York is safe. It's always been safe. When I took office, we were the most dangerous state in America. When I left, we were the fourth safest state in America. And Rudy Giuliani gives a lot of credit for the policing on that, as does Mike Bloomberg and Ray Kelly for what they did. Uh, but that can be lost. And when that is lost, the economic opportunities in New York and elsewhere are going to be uh, enormously diminished. And uh, the other thing that always troubles me is you have all these people on Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue saying, oh, yeah, limit the police, tie up the hands of the police. Well, if, you, if you're a Times writer who takes Uber, uh, to work every day, uh, you're pretty safe. Uh, but if you're working in a bodega and you work four at midnight, you take the subway home at midnight, you're the one who, who is most at risk of violent crime. Or if you live in a low-income minority neighborhood, you're the one most at risk of violent crime. If you have a doorman on Fifth Avenue, nobody's going to mug you going into your building. But that's not the case if you're living in Brownsville and you don't have an effective police presence. So, so I think the assaults on the police have been terrible. I think the need to reform the police in a way where we have the ability to throw out the bad actors, and of course there are bad actors in the police department. We saw that in George Floyd, and there are many, many others who have been able to get away with it. And we have to work doubly hard to try to bring us together racially. Uh, but I don't think that uh, uh, demonizing the police is at all helpful as a way to achieve that. Thank you. And my last question. You said that you're not pessimistic for America, but for its politics. Would you elaborate on this important perspective and how we get from our collective cultural values to an effective functioning government? You know, Ken, I think that that is the key question facing the country right now. How do we have effective government that reflects the needs and the wishes of the American people? And I try to outline some, some solutions there. The American people, in my view, feel that the government in Washington is not their government. 
it is some distant entity. And whether it's Democrats or Republicans in control at a particular time, it's not their government. It's not our government. It's the insider's government. And I think they're right. I think to a large extent, this government doesn't reflect what the American people believe in. There are a million reasons for that. One is the enormous power of lobbying. Right now, there are more lobbyists who used to serve in the House or Senate than there are members of the House. You get to Washington. Within six months, you know that if you lose or choose not to run again at some point, you don't ever go back home. You'll be hired by some major organization, a law firm, a lobbying organization, and they'll pay you millions of dollars to use your contacts to represent the interests of these wealthy groups, whether it's Google or the oil companies or the teachers union. They have enormous undue influence on the politics and the policies in Washington. So I, I don't just point out problems, I try to point out some solutions. Uh, and one is a lifetime ban on anyone who ever served in the House or the Senate ever being a lobbyist. How hard is that to achieve? How many Americans would agree that when you get elected to the House, you get elected to the Senate, you should say, I agree, I will never serve one day as a lobbyist because it's a privilege to be a representative in this country. A company like Google or a company like Exxon spends 10, 20, 50 million, 100 million dollars with lobbyists trying to influence policy. All right, then they go out and try to elect their friends to influence that policy. Well, we have a constitution so you can't ban lobbying, but you could say that any company or organization that hires a lobbyist to advance a policy cannot engage themselves in political campaigning. They can't make donations. They can't go out and campaign. They get, can't give in kind donations. You have a choice. You can lobby and try to affect the output of government, or you can get involved in campaigns and try to elect who's serving in that government. You don't have the ability to do two. These are two minor steps we could do to bring government back to the people as opposed to the, the beltway circle in both parties that truly, I think, controls too much of Washington. And then the government should actually solve problems. You know, we do have real problems facing this country. And uh, you mentioned climate change. That's one. Uh, I think one area where we could have bipartisan agreement that the public would get behind is to have an enormous uh, Manhattan Project aimed at energy solutions that are not just American solutions, but global solutions that allow us to have unlimited clean energy with virtually no greenhouse gas emissions. I don't think that's impossible at all. If we take unilateral steps, if we close down every coal plant in the United States of America today, next year there'd still be more coal plants spewing CO2 into the atmosphere than, than are today because of what China, India, Malaysia, and other countries are doing. The solution is an American developed technological breakthrough that allows us to have unlimited clean energy. And the government should be at the forefront of empowering the private sector to come up with those solutions. It helps clean the environment and deal with climate change, and it helps our economy as we go forward. There are other solutions, things like immigration. Uh, I mean, this touches every community and almost every family in America. And you had the two extremes. You had the crazy Republicans saying, we're gonna put everybody who came here illegally, even if they've been here for 50 years, on trains and boxcars and send them back to where they've never been. That's ridiculous, it's never gonna happen. It never should happen. And then you have the other extreme on the Democratic left saying we shouldn't have borders. People who want to come here should be allowed to come here. We don't care what their ability is or how many of them there are, or whether or not they're bringing drugs or, or disease with them. You have to control the borders. And these are not extreme positions. These are positions Americans. Americans, Republicans, Democrats, the majority believe it. We have to find a way to come up with a legal status change for the people who are here illegally because we're not going to send them home. And we don't want them to live continually under a cloud. And at the same time, we have to control our borders because there's no successful country in the world that hasn't known who is coming in or not coming in to their country. Uh, so you combine the two of those with some other solutions. and We could have a bipartisan solution that the American people are overwhelmingly behind. So, so I'm an optimist because I believe in the people, not necessarily in the politicians currently in office, but the American people understand what's right for the country intuitively. And if they had the right leadership coming up with those solutions, I think we could solve the problems and restore people's confidence in government. That's why I call it beyond the great divide. We're in the great divide right now. We have to move beyond it. 
thank you. I mean, I apologize if I gave any impression <laughs> other than I want to hear your very thoughtful voice. No, no, yeah, don't apologize. I know you could that. defend I yourself it. more than that. It's please. more fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I would like to turn over the uh, session to questions from the uh, attendees. Uh, Dennis, would you handle the uh, mechanism? Sure, if, if you want to raise your hand and I'll unmute you and then you can ask your question. Uh, Sheila Rogers, click on mute. Well, thank you, Governor Pataki. This is really very interesting. The one area that you did not talk about were some of the big companies now like Google and Amazon and Facebook and Apple. What's your opinion about perhaps breaking them up as monopolies? Do you think that it would be beneficial to the country or it would be detrimental to the country? I, I think that's something we certainly should look at. I, I think the monopolistic power they have over so much interaction, uh, the public square is no longer Union Square where you, where you go down and stand on a soapbox on 14th Street. It's Facebook or it's Google. Uh, and, and they have private unilateral power, monopolistic power over so much of the interaction of American thought. And I think that is wrong. I think the concentration is wrong. So I think we have to take a hard look at breaking them up so that you don't have a single group, a single private company deciding what is fit for the American people to hear. But I think there's an even bigger problem than that. And I really appreciate the question, Sheila, because it is a huge problem when you have these private companies deciding what the American people can see or hear. That's not right. That shouldn't be the case. But it's even worse when that happens in academia and universities. And in the book, I took a little, talked a little bit about this whole woke concept where you're not allowed, uh, people don't, don't just disagree with you. You're not allowed to express an opinion if it's an opinion that certain groups on campus deem disqualified. Uh, and you know, I imagine there are dozens of campuses where I wouldn't be allowed to speak today. Uh, and my view is that college is the time when you should be the most open-minded, when you should be the most susceptible to hearing things you don't believe in. Because you grow up in your narrow community and in your family, you want to be exposed to the broadest range of facts and ideas possible because you know what, you might not be right. And that's true of a college kid, and it's true, true of an 85 year old sitting reading a book, they might not be right. Being open-minded and listening to people you disagree with is really the best way to learn and to challenge your viewpoints. And so we need that with Facebook, we need that with Twitter and Google, but more importantly, we need it on our academic campuses. And to me, so many of the people who are disinvited to speak at graduations, or so many faculty people or qualified academicians or thinkers who are shouted down by radicals on campuses, radicals of the left, it's not the right, on these campuses is a threat to our freedom uh, that is just, uh, to me, very scary. And I do talk at length about that in the book. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Patty Kenner. Give me one second. Okay. Patty, you have to unmute. We don't hear you, Patty. Why don't we see if somebody else wants to ask a question while Patty's working that out, okay? Let me, uh... I raised my hand. Okay, there you go, you're on, Randy. Okay, great, thank you. Ken, Ken and uh, Governor Pataki, great job, and I uh, appreciate, the opportunity to, appreciate the opportunity to listen in. Don't hold on, hold on. 
I'm not sure what that is. Okay, Randy, go ahead. So the, the question I had is, and I haven't read the book, I'm sure Ken will give me the Monarch notes over the weekend. I have the, a book right here for you. <laughs> Good. Uh, but, but I've always been struck by the fact, and it, it sounds like a lot, of, uh, a lot of this pertains to some of the past president's uh, divisiveness, but to me, extremism in, in, in both the right and the left is what has, is really resulting in a lot of divisiveness in this country as well as in the world, whether it's Bernie Sanders and uh, AOC on one side and Donald Trump and uh, his evan evangelicals on the other side. It, it seems to me there's more and more people that are being pushed you know, away from one side to the other, becoming more radical left on, on the left side and more radical right on the right side. How, how do you see us, I don't know if you agree with that, but and I'd like to hear if you do, and how do you see us addressing that going forward? You know, I totally agree with that. And I think that is a huge challenge to our country. I think there are, uh, I quote in the book, Bill Clinton saying, I have an ideology, but I'm not an ideologue. Uh, and I think that distinction is very important. I feel the same way. I have an ideology, but I'm not an ideologue. And when you're an ideologue, you essentially become closed-minded. You don't listen to um, people who have a distant, different viewpoint because they're inherently wrong uh, and are not worthy of your time. And we're seeing more and more people elected in both parties, particularly the energy in the Democratic Party is now on the far left, and I don't think there's any disputing that. Uh, how do you correct that? I think you just have to continue at every level. Um, I mentioned the universities. The universities have to stop the harassment and disqualifying of intelligent, legitimate conservative speakers on campuses. Let's look at the media. The media, I think, is the biggest culprit of all. Uh, I love the news. I am an absolute news junkie, and I don't know where to go. I don't want to be told what to think, you know, that this happened and you should think this as a consequence. I just want to know what happened. They're not perfectly capable of finding out, thinking through on my own what I should think about. But whether it's MSNBC, CNN, or Fox, where do you go to simply find out this happened today and then this happened later today? So I think we need neutral news sources uh, that just tell us what happened and then let us figure out for ourselves what we should think. We did academia where um, orthodoxy is challenged, uh, whether it's orthodoxy in the right at some schools, very few or orthodoxy at the left at, at a huge majority of those schools. And we need politicians who stand up to those ideologues and say, you know, um, you have your viewpoint. Uh, it's perfectly okay for you to have that viewpoint, but I reject it haven't thought about it because I think your ideology is not a practical solution for our country. You know, I remember giving a speech maybe 10 years ago to a group, largely English, or maybe it was 12 or even longer, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and I said, you know, it used to be, I would follow uh, British politics and they had such a terrible mess because you had the labor radical leftists socialists, and then you had the conservatives, very ideological conservatives. Conservatives would win, privatize things, then there'd be all sorts of strikes. Labor would win, they'd naturalize things, you'd have a complete catastrophe and things breaking down. The conservatives would win, and they lurched from one ideology to another. Um, and America, I always prided ourselves in the fact that we're pragmatic. If you have a problem, you solve a problem. You don't try to impose an ideology, you solve the problem. Uh, and it is completely reversed. Now, if you look at it, in England, they're far more pragmatic in trying to solve problems. And here we've become ideological. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's the American people yet. If you look at all the polling among the public, the vast majority are so, still somewhere in the middle, center left, center right, moderate. <clears throat> but if you look in Washington, you have these polarized ideologues. And I think uh, I've actually written about this too. I think it's uh, the failure of the primary process. Look at Bill de Blasio in New York. The Bill de Blasio, when he got elected mayor, got elected with 40% of the Democratic primary voters uh, voted uh, for him. Only 20% of the eligible Democratic registered voters voted in that primary. 
He got 8% of the registered Democrats, who were the most ideological, obviously. Uh, and then because it's a one-party city, he waltzed into an election. After having had only 8% of the registered Democrats in the city, only 4% of the eligible voters in the city. And you see that in the primaries in the last couple of weeks, where low turnout, in many of these cases, the most whole, the most partisan, the most ideological, the most non-pragmatic vote in the primaries. Um, and, you know, in my personal experience, if we had not had a convention, if we had had a primary instead of having a convention, I wouldn't have gotten a Republican nomination. I would have lost to a far more doctrinaire, ideological Republican, because they would have been the minority that turned out to vote as a majority in a primary. So I think one of the things we should look at is that whole primary system, uh, which seems to empower the most partisan and the most uh, ideological. So uh, I think it's a real problem. I think there are solutions, but I don't see anybody really working towards that solution, although they are there. Okay, we're gonna try Patty Tanner again. Hi. I hear you fine. It's a little reverberating, but I always love Star Trek. So. Can you hear me now, Kevin? I did. Um, are you getting vibrations or that's just me? Good vibrations. Can you hear me normally? <laughs> we hear you yeah. fine. Um, well, I love what Governor Pataki said about academia. As a trustee of a university, with a discussion one hour ago with the president talking about a professor who was asked to come to our university, who was very controversial. What I have a terrible time with is when someone preaches hate. Here we are trying, one of our biggest problems in America is racism, anti-Semitism, and hate. Where do you draw the line between someone who has different ideas from you and someone who preaches hate for a particular group? You know, I, I, I think that is an absolutely critical question. Uh, and I don't think it should be that hard to answer. It's pretty obvious if someone spews anti-Semitism or spews racism, uh, that they, this is not uh, an academic uh, exercise that deserves being considered. But what has happened is those who are conservatives, those who believe in limited government, who don't necessarily support the level of social programs or support open immigration or support a policy uh, like uh, open borders or immediate citizenship for people who are here illegally. Those are things worth debating. Those are not bigoted things. And I think uh, part of the problem we have in academia today is when you have such a lopsided um, uh, faculty and lopsided administrations that oftentimes things that people like me, and I don't, maybe some of your viewers consider me an extremist, but I'm half my party considers me not ideological enough at least, um, that people like me all of a sudden shouldn't be uh, welcome on a campus because I happen to think things like lower tax rate expands economic opportunity for everyone, including most importantly, the lowest income people in our country. You know, and to extrapolate racism or bigotry from that is something that happens a lot today. And that, to me, is very frightening. You know, so overexpressions are obvious. Racist, anti-Semitic, uh, anti-woman, those things are anti-gay. Um, things that are blatantly uh, discriminatory, that is not legitimate thought. That is bigotry. But different ideas as to how you advance our country as a society, you know, those, I think, uh, are not. And even if the vast majority of people on a faculty or administration disagree with those ideas, that's not a reason to disqualify them from being heard by your students. In fact, those are the ideas most important for those students to hear. Uh, Celia and Paul. Hi. You're on, go ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, really enjoyed your comments very much, Governor Pataki. Uh, you are the very model of a model elder statesman. Uh, we need more people well, like you. Well, thank you. I'm trying to fend off the elder part of the statesman. <laughs> So here's my question. Here's my question. What happened to the New York Times? <laughs> it is a sad, sad state. You know, I, my whole time growing up, not when I was a kid, we didn't get the Times. We didn't get any newspapers. I grew up in, on a farm where um, uh, we just didn't get newspapers except for our local paper. But then when I got to college, I and all through my time as governor, I made sure first things read the times. Uh, but it no longer to me is a newspaper. Uh, it's a political journal. And sometimes they have news that you can't get anywhere else. But more often than not, the news is chosen to advance an ideological standpoint. And I have actually said that to people at the times. And it's just to me very sad because it was the great paper. And now, you know, it's just uh, something where they have a, a an ideological agenda, and the news is is sorted out to fit in with that ideological agenda. Uh, and one of the interesting things is the Russian collusion thing, where the Times had a front page article about all the Russian contacts with the Trump administration that the Justice Department had found. And Peter Strzok, this just came out in the last month, the FBI guy in charge of this, and the note says, we haven't found any of that. So the Times was running something, and I'm sure they had a source uh, that the person in charge of it at the FBI, even though he was doing everything he could to stop Trump from ever uh, being president, uh, said it just isn't true. And I think that's just one of dozens of examples where the Times selects the news to advance a political cause. Uh, and sadly, it's not that uncommon. Uh, New York Post does the same thing. Uh, they're on the conservative side. But as I was saying earlier, where do you go to just find out what happened? It becomes harder and harder. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the ideological polarization in the country is people are just denied you know, the Harry Reasoner or the Chet Hunter or, or, or the person or, or the, the Walter Cronkite, where you just watch and found out, okay, this happened. And then I can form my own view. We need that again. And I'd like to think that a media that chose to do that to just provide news, whether it's a newspaper or a, uh, a website or a broadcast station, they just said that we're going to tell you the news of what happened. I would hope they could be a big success because there are a lot of people like us who want the news and don't want a selected view of the news. Who else would like to ask a question? Okay, Diane Crook. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Governor Pataki. This is so interesting and really just gives a whole other perspective from what I see every day. Not to put you on the spot, but beyond this election, do you see anybody coming up that you have some faith in to, to sort of address all of these issues and bring us together? You know, uh, Dan, thank you. And thank you for your kind comments. And, I, and I'm sure what I'm saying is something that a lot of people watch it don't often hear um, uh, because it is New York. and, and I hope that I, I, I'm, just, I'm trying to make sense. I'm not so arrogant as to think everything I'm saying is right. Uh, and I'm always willing to listen to different viewpoints, but I think too often in New York, you don't hear different viewpoints. And hopefully this has a little bit of that. I have great confidence. There are tremendous people coming up, a lot of good young elected officials. And I've, I've always been a great believer in, in the value of governors. Uh, you know, the, when you're the governor, when you're a legislator, it's easy to be an idiot. You vote yes, you vote no. You don't have to deal with the consequences. Uh, it's out there. The bill takes effect or it doesn't take effect and it impacts people's lives. You are distant from the consequences of voting yes or no. It's easy to be an idiot. When you're the executive, when you're the governor, you have to deal with the consequences of all this. But you can't say, hey, you know, this whole part of the state is falling apart. Look what the legislature did. Well, you're the governor. You have to make it work. So you have to, uh, I found that in both parties, the governors tend to be far more pragmatic because they have to make it work. They're the ones sitting at the desk accountable for whatever uh, is going on, including what the legislature might send, send them. 
So I think in both parties across the country, there are a lot of really good, capable young governors who are doing an excellent job. Charlie Baker in Massachusetts is one. Nikki Haley in South Carolina, uh, I think, did a great job uh, in South Carolina and at the UN. And there are others. And, uh, and, and as I said, in both parties uh, who understand what it is to be an executive. And I think as president, knowing politics and knowing what it takes to be an executive, I think, is an enormous value that, that has been underestimated of late. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. I'd like to ask a question if I can. Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Uh, Peter Wolf. I'm wondering, Governor, if you think that uh, the polarization that's occurred in the, in the management of the country has anything to do with Citizens United? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I talk about it in the book. And, you know, it's, uh, to me, I wonder if today I would go into politics again. Uh, because when I got involved, you know, I remember my first fundraiser, if we raised eight or nine hundred dollars, you know, we were happy. You know, my God, look at all this money. Uh, and today you have two sides to that coin. You have uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, you can only give $2,800 to the federal candidate. Uh, I think it's absurd because uh, Michael Bloomberg can go out and spend a billion dollars. He literally spent a billion dollars running for office or supporting issues. Uh, and there's nothing he can do about it because of the Constitution. So uh, to me, the influence of money and it's not Citizens United. The Citizens United has nothing to do with George Soros or Michael Bloomberg or David Polk or others going out there and spending tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars to influence a campaign. So if I give you $2,801 to your campaign, it's illegal because I'm going to have undue influence. But if I want to spend $28 million helping your candidacy, through my own money or a pact that I create, nothing to do with Citizens United, that's perfectly fine. It's an absurd system, it doesn't work. And as draconian as it sounds, I think one of the things that we should consider is getting rid of those campaign finance limits, require people to donate to the candidate so that the candidate is held accountable for what is run as an ad. Right now, an outside group can run a hideous ad attacking someone, left or right. Uh, and the candidate goes, oh, I don't know anything about it. It's an independent group. Uh, and that's true. They don't know what's, they, it should be true. Legally, it should be true. They don't know what's going on. So the, the campaign finance is a shambles. Getting rid of Citizens United isn't going to do it. We're still going to have that enormous influence of money if we had immediate disclosure and a requirement that it all throw, flow through a candidate's campaign. At least we would have knowledge and accountability. Whereas now, you know, there are these PACs spending hundreds of millions of dollars, whether it's the oil companies or the teachers union, nobody knows who they are. They can say anything they want. There's no transparency and there's no accountability on the part of the candidate who could benefit from that. That should change. Uh, Ken, would you like to close out? Sure. Thank you, everyone. It's been a very, very thoughtful uh, afternoon. There's so much that the governor has done uh, to make our state great. And I'm glad to see that he has such strong and fertile ideas as to how we can make the nation great. So anytime he's ready to run for president, I'm there. <laughs> thank you all for participating. Ken, Ken, let me thank you so much for doing this. It's a beautiful Thursday afternoon and out in the Hamptons, I'm sure nobody wants to be inside. Uh, and I want to thank you as well for serving in the administration of one of New York City's great governors, Ed Koch, and for all you did when you were there. And uh, uh, you're a New York treasure. Stay well and think about some of the things I said. I do. I do. That's exactly why I asked the questions. <laughs> I thank know. You. I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And we hope we see all of you next year under the tent. Uh, hope so, too. In, in person. Love to and be there. get Allison to come forward so we can interview her. It's a magnificent book, Queen's Fortune. Thank everybody you. should read it. Yep.
Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure she'd love to if that could be set up. Thank you very much. Thank you.